uh, start recording right there. Okay. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the January session of the Mid-Michigan Roundtable. It is the advent of Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day is this coming Friday, February 2nd, and Punxsutawney Phil will pop out of his burrow and we'll have to see whether he sees his shadow or not. That will determine for us Northerners how much more winter we have. Maybe it'll determine for Cy whether he gets another snowfall or not down in Atlanta as well. I'm joined this evening by my good friends, Mark Robertson and Cy Lynch. Uh, Cy is coming to us direct from Atlanta and Mark is coming to us from his basement in Rochester Hills, Michigan. So uh, without further ado, you know the drill that this is an educational presentation. Everything that we talk about tonight, they're for educational purposes. Even though we're talking about specific stocks, we are not making recommendations for you to buy, sell, or hold. We urge you to do your own homework and draw your own conclusions from your own analysis. That should be enough to take us off the hook. And if you don't agree with this, Mark always tells you, that uh, you'll have to leave the session at this point. Yeah, we'll, okay. We'll, we'll send in the bouncers. Okay. Here's our agenda. It's a pretty standard uh, standing agenda. Uh, we will look at, at results. We'll look at uh, some challenges tonight. We are going to look at, at uh, uh, four or five different stocks to challenge, either to leave in or take out of the portfolio. Uh, we are going to present three stocks this evening. We'll poll the audience, and then we always take your questions and answers and try not to leave the session until we have them answered or until we've promised you that we're going to try to get to them in a future session. Uh, this is a demonstration that we're doing. Uh, it's uh, a chance for us to share stock ideas with our audience. Uh, the whole idea is for us to bring one of our single favorite investment ideas each month, add it to what we call a tracking portfolio, and then keep track of what's going on. Uh, we'd like to keep it around 70 to 80 percent core holdings. That means the the great old standard holdings that better investors are known for, the up, straight, and parallel stocks that should be making up the majority of most of our portfolios. But we do entertain uh, a couple of percentage points, as much as 20 or 25 percent of our portfolio, in non-core selections, things that are much more frisky, maybe even a little bit speculative. Uh, our goal is to try to reach a place where our long-term relative return is greater than 5%. Now, relative return might be new to some of you in the audience. That just means we'd like to beat whatever the Standard & Poor's is doing on any given year by around five points. That's an extremely aggressive goal, by the way, and yet that's the better investing goal that we've all lived with since we joined the organization. That 15% goal that is set for clubs really comes from the idea of beating the average market by five points year in, year out. The average in the stock market for return has been somewhere between nine and a half and 10 and a half points now for a significant amount of time. We're going to measure our return against the Wiltshire 5000, and we'd also like to see our accuracy in stock picking uh, beat the market by 60 to 70 percent. Uh, here's where we're at right now. You can see the general trend uh, for the last five years or so has been moving upward. Uh, I would say that our relative return right now is what, Mark? Somewhere just right around 3%? Yeah, it's right around 3 And in fact, you, you notice on the right-hand side, it's tailed off a little bit. That's because it's been so darned difficult to stay ahead of this market the last couple of months. But uh, we've actually seen an increase in the overall rate of return over the last seven and a half years. And even that has, has had a hard time staying ahead of this hard-charging market. I promised some of my good friends at the home office, Mark, that in this 
the session tonight, I would remind everybody that markets do go down occasionally, and they do go down more than one or two percent occasionally. Hey, they went, people need to keep that in mind. They went down know? today, and everybody's panicking. Well, but today was just a little bit less than one percent as measured by the Wiltshire 5000. So, uh, you know, it used to be one percent didn't bother us too much. But today, because one percent is in the 200 points plus range in the Dow, uh, suddenly we become very concerned about it. Uh, it it's just it is what it is. Uh, I would like to focus on our rate of return since inception. And this tracking portfolio has turned out 15.6%. If you're in an investment club that can claim for the for seven plus years, seven and a half years, that you've done 15 and a half percent, no matter what the market's been doing, then you've been more than doubling your money every five years. You know that drill. That's a great goal for any club, no matter what the market is doing. And we've been hitting that 15% plus now. Uh, and that extends since the first day of the round table up to this point right now. Uh, here's our holdings in the round table. If you want to look at the entire list of holdings, you can go to that uh, URL at the top of the screen up there, manifestinvesting.com slash dashboards slash public slash round dash table. This is a free link that will take you right to this dashboard, which will show the entire listing of holdings in the tracking portfolio. This is not a portfolio that we would suggest a club would own or an individual would own. This is tracking our ideas and trying to keep us honest as far as are your ideas as good as you really think they are. At the bottom, you see a legend, and the legend is easily read when you see 12x at the beginning of the legend and then you see the cognizant ticker that means that cognizant has been picked 12 different times from the inception of the round table to this point uh, that's a thousand dollars each so twelve thousand dollars has gone into cognizant if you look at the top of the list, Cognizant is our largest holding, and it's worth 24,000 plus today. So that 12,000 has doubled uh, since we began putting Cognizant into the uh, uh, portfolio. And then as you go along, you see that the number of times that different stocks has been chosen uh, changes and, and has been changing uh, pretty regularly. This is our largest set of holdings. Mark, anything that draws your fancy on this uh, set of holdings right now at the top? Well, just one thing. We are going to put Cisco on the hot seat. That's a five-time selection, so $5,000 invested in Cisco. It's our seventh largest holding, and you can see that 5000 has become 12000 Seven 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 seventy six. I think each one of us has selected it at least once, and this goes, in some cases, almost seven years back. And uh, it's been quite good to us. You'll see how good it's been here lately. But that's one that jumps off the page. And then we also do like to point out that there are some uh, fairly obscure names on this list from time to time. Universal Display was fairly obscure until uh, we started kicking it around a few years ago. But from top to bottom, you want to always be seeking. Uh, you know, exciting, promising, smaller growth companies, faster growing companies. And uh, we always try to do that here. I think it's so interesting also, Mark, that, that there are non-traditional stocks on this list. Bank of America certainly doesn't have a beautiful stock selection guide. Uh, but when Hugh first started choosing Bank of America and putting it into this tracking portfolio, I think it probably was selling for less than maybe seven or eight dollars. It was a a pretty cheap uh, stock to throw into the portfolio, and you can see that it's returned almost sixteen thousand dollars right now. And if you check down on the legend, I'm sure you can see how many times it has been. Uh, chosen, but it's certainly not the kind of uh, stock that we would call up straight and parallel. But it just goes to show you can make money uh, if your if your thesis uh, is correct. And back in the recession, Hugh was telling us, "I want to own a bank," mm -hmm. and uh, there there it was. You and know, uh, it's been uh, it's been kind to us. I was thinking just the other day that back back in that time frame when. 
Bank of America was actually fairly hated uh, after the the Great Recession, and I would I just wonder if General Electric doesn't fit that mode today. He's been accumulating General Electric for this portfolio, and man, it's tough. You you got to grit your teeth, and uh, and he, he may be doing it again. I would also point out that he's brought Amazon just two times. That's a two time selection of Amazon that is now worth nearly ten thousand dollars. So it can be done. Sai, any thoughts on uh, on Aflac or any of the of your favorites on here? Uh, nothing in particular. I was just uh, the the one that I that did catch my eye. I mean, it's been for a while. Is uh, C. H. Robinson? They're right about in the middle. Uh, I think that's a five time selection. Uh, if I was looking right, yes, five times, um, and that was that's just. While that's certainly not spectacular from five to eight thousand, uh, that is significant increase in the last six months, six to twelve months. And uh, I just mentioned that as a as an example of patience, which of course Bank of America is another good example of patience because Hugh had to hold his nose and all of our noses for a while. Mm -hmm. And he's brutally Bank patient. Of America mm -hmm. a, as well. Mark, am I missing something? Uh, I'm looking at the legend, and I don't see NetEase listed, which means that it would be a single one-time choice. Oh. And if somebody sees NetEase down there in the legend, let me know. But if it's a one-time choice, it's gone from $1,000 to uh, almost $7,000 uh, during the time we've held it. Now, I know that it's done phenomenal things because one of my clubs holds this stock, and we're continually pruning it back. Uh, it's It continually jumps up to 25 28% of our portfolio, and we, we – we pull it back a little bit, but if that's a one-time choice, that's certainly a, a phenomenal growth uh, in that particular I'll, company. I'll double check it. It's certainly no more than two, and it could be missing, but I, I only remember one, and you're certainly entitled to a cyber pat on the back for that one. <laughs> I do think while we're on this slide, Ken, we should point out that when we look at portfolios, and again, this is a tracking portfolio of the individual decisions, you know, keeping track of how our ideas do. But we, you know, we do look at the overall portfolio, and you can see that uh, in the case of the most important things that we track, um, the overall return forecast, the PAR on the far right-hand column, that is down thanks to the increase in stock prices, all the way down to eight and a half percent. The average stock right now checks in at about six percent, so we'd like to see that number bumped up. Quality is fine in the next column over from uh, the far right-hand side at 85. That basically says our comp companies are predominantly excellent. And then that third major indicator is what is the overall average sales growth? And again, these are all weighted averages. Checking in at 10.6, yeah, we want to see that in that 11 to 12 percent range. So that one's okay. Anything we can do to keep it there, we should. So, you know, we should be looking for stocks tonight which have returns, which will help that eight and a half percent without messing anything else up. Uh, I was just looking. I was fairly certain I had picked NetEase, and I did back in February of 12, uh, I think doubling down Ken's selection. So it, it's at least a two times pick, and that may be all. It's just two. Okay, well, then we have to cyber pat both of you on the back. Well, and Mark, it could be that I did not choose it. Uh, I've never been a huge fan of, of Chinese companies ever since I got burned real badly by a couple of them. <laughs> so I might have I might have completely avoided this, even though it stands as one of the best performers in in our model uh, investment club. I'm going to move on now uh, to the next uh, slide, and the next slide is showing what, what's on our hot seat right now based on par. Uh, these are the five companies at the lowest end of the list of stocks as ranked by par. So we're, we're looking at SEIC, which has been in this portfolio for a long, long while. Uh, Cisco Systems, which Mark already tele telegraphed that we were gonna, going to put on the hot seat. Amazon, Microsoft, and Under Armour. And Mark has made the request that we hold off on making a decision on SEIC, on Amazon, and on Microsoft because they're due for an update in the next week or so. 
And because we're so near the end of the update cycle for these companies, uh, the numbers might change significantly to give us a different par number. So we're going to kind of postpone any uh, uh, decisions about those three companies until the February roundtable. But we are going to look seriously at Cisco and we are going to look seriously at uh, under Armour. Before we leave this slide, uh, up in the top right here, you can see that uh, the long-term return forecasts are really moving uh, in a place for value line that that is uh, historically, or at least recent history, history pretty low. Uh, Mark had mentioned that uh, the average stock's return now is about 6%, and I think my power is measuring it at actually under 6%. Is that correct right now, Mark? Yeah, just under. And, you know, one of the reasons I bring it up and, and the reason I suggest we we wait on those three is we actually are seeing, as we as we go through every company during the update cycle, um, Value Line is bolstering their predictions. You know, growth rate predictions, profitability predictions, and PEs. So some some of these could actually be uh, bolstered up and out of a sell zone, if you will. So you know, when you look at that chart, you know, uh, one of one of the major differences between the two graphs is that one is just the value line opinion. The one on the right it represents a consensus, where you're looking at S and P analyst consensus and a few other things, including Morningstar. So you, you bring all of them to the party, they're slightly more optimistic in general. Doesn't necessarily mean they're right, but uh, we do see this happening kind of across the board, especially the last three or four weekly updates that the companies have been getting steadily stronger. And you can see a company like SCI Investments go from a return forecast of one up to, say, six. In other words, in line with the market after the, after the adjustments and the increased expectations come to play. Uh, we'd be re very remiss if we didn't remind everybody uh, also that we have a brand new tax law and that tax law is going to muddy our windshields going forward for uh, at least the next three or four or five quarters uh, until we begin to see how the companies are treating it. Uh, if you're trying to factor the taxes in, don't forget that if the company spends some of this money that right now they're spending on taxes, if they spend it on their workers, for example, that's going to translate into uh, an expense. And uh, that'll affect the margins if, if enough of that money is transferred from paying taxes into uh, expenses. So there's going to be a couple of lines in the preferred procedure that are going to have some shakeout. And on top of that, we've already heard from a lot of companies that are going to do uh, some playing around with their dividend. That's an expense. But they're also going to play around with share repurchases. And that's another line on the preferred procedure. So uh, one of our favorite tools, our, our business analysis tool, is going to be a little bit uh, opaque going forward until we, we get a chance to see exactly exactly what the new tax law means for each of the companies that we own. And I just, my counsel is to be extremely patient. Uh, you're not going to have exact answers in three months or six months. It might take as much as a year, year and a half, two years. And remind yourself also that the repatriation tax on money that they're going to bring back to this country from overseas is going to further muddy the waters a little bit and is not going to give us a clear picture on taxes, uh, at least in the near term, uh, or not nearly as clear as we'd like it to be. So with all that being said, we're looking at Cisco, and I'm just going to point out that Cisco's sales growth is at 3.4%. That was one of the numbers Mark said that we really needed to keep up around 11, 11.5%. I think it's just under 11 right now for our portfolio. And that sales growth uh, translates into a par of of this is coming near money markets now. You can actually get money market returns out there for about a percent now. So we're uh, we're putting Cisco on the hot seat. And Mark, why don't you speak to the three graphs that we normally display when we're looking at a hot seat stock? Sure, and I'll also do a shameless plug because we don't have time to cover it now, but a week from tonight, Ken and I will be covering you know the market melt up in the the crazy things that are going on in the market, along with a little more, hopefully, science. We'll be trying to do some homework and 
share the type of impacts and things that need to be thought about as we do our stock studies going forward. You know, what you're basically looking at it for Cisco is, as I mentioned, some of the, the positions taken in Cisco date back almost seven years, and all, I think all of us have selected it. You can see the last several years have been pretty good to us, and the last several months have been really good. So it's it's taken off, and in fact, I know some people who have uh, actually lightened up or sold some positions in Cisco, just kind of taking advantage of this opportunity in a company like this. You can see from that second graph down that, over the trailing 12 months, the company is up 44%, a lot of that in the last three months. So that is what has driven our return forecast, our projected annual return down to uh, almost approaching zero. And we try not to ignore that whenever we can, uh, whenever we can notice. Uh, we're looking at the value line for Cisco and uh, you can see that the five-year return, Mark has circled it over here on the right, uh, the five-year return has been very healthy, and this is at a recent price of $37. Uh, you can see that value line has a pretty uh, in common uh, opinion of the future uh, growth for Cisco, the next three to five years. They're suggesting at the low side, Cisco can maybe make 2%. Uh, and we were saying in the manifest number that one and a half is is somewhere along the, the places that Cisco can give us appreciation. So we're, we're kind of in agreement with one of our trusted sources right here. And uh, I think that unless this chart right here is going to show us anything different, and it's not really going to show us anything different, uh, I'm going to... Uh, not have any objections to moving this out of our tracking portfolio for the moment. Uh, it's a great company. I, I see a lot of things happening, but uh, we just don't have enough return to keep it in. And the sales right now are not as robust as we'd like the sales to be to contribute to the overall uh, portfolio. Uh, what say you, Cy and Mark? What do you think? I am all for selling. Uh, and and the two two key factors I would look at is the the par uh, coupled with that low sales growth potential. Yeah, and I would I would say the same thing. I mean, even even with a slightly higher PE expectation, and that's driven by the consensus again, uh, you're still looking at low single digits. Again, as Ken said, when your your stocks begin approaching money market rates. And the portfolio does need more return forecast. If it didn't, we'd have a completely different discussion because this is a very high quality company. But uh, I think we sidestep it and watch for an opportunity to buy it back someday. Yeah. And, and one, one thing I, I noticed just looking at, at this particular chart, I had not picked it up earlier. Uh, and uh, although I follow Cisco loosely, I don't believe I own any currently. Um, I, the the return primarily on this particular chart um, is in the dividend, which that's a rather interesting phenomenon that uh, you have no price appreciation. Yep, absolutely. It's a sign of a maturing company that's not – this is not our, our grandfather's Cisco Systems or even our father. So, uh, I didn't hear any uh, any negatives, so uh, let's put Cisco on the uh, sell list uh, going forward. And now let's look at a train wreck. And I'm afraid that I'm responsible for a piece of this train wreck. I, I was a big supporter of Fossil three or four years ago. And I wish that our discipline of following quality would have been in place three or four years ago, because when this quality dropped, uh, and you can see the, the precipitous drop uh, somewhere at the end of 2015. When the quality of this stock dropped, that should have been our sell signal right there. And uh, notice that after it dropped, uh, we had, uh, and you can count the green bars underneath that horizontal piece. I'm kind of pointing to it right now, right there. We had three or four months of stock prices somewhere between 45 and 55 where we could have made a decision to sell the company. After the drop, we still had a significant period of time 
Here we are now finally deciding to sell Cisco, but it's down in single digits now, maybe Fossil. as as I'm sorry, Fossil, maybe as low as two or three dollars a share. So uh, this discipline that we've been doing to look for some triggers, uh, we're becoming more and more convinced that quality is a wonderful trigger uh, for stocks that are just falling apart and that we'll see the drop in quality and still have a little bit of time to jump out of the stock before it just finally moves to, to nothingness. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to suggest that we unload all of our positions in holding. I know that uh, I suggested we buy it a couple times. I know the audience concurred uh, at least one time. I don't know, Mark, did you or Cy or Hugh ever put a fossil into the pile or was it basically my error? Well, you, you know, I usually jump in and point out when I have ideas. This one is really kind of foggy for me. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm having a hard time remembering. Uh, the, answer, the answer, in other words, is yes, right? <laughs> Apparently so. I, okay. I think I defended it. <laughs> my memory is not foggy. I have not had that one in prime. And, and uh, I'm biggest is man. that uh, I am not, uh, I, I, it takes a lot for me to get into apparel, although I will claim coach as one of my not real successful uh, picks for a while, although and, that's bounced back a good bit. So well, do we have any, either of you suggest we should keep this in the tracking portfolio? Well, do this one. I think keep Mark's so that he can remember <laughs> <it> better. <laughs> just, just keep Mark's position, right? right. There, there is one all. thing I, I would like to kind of cap off with this one. Though, and it it kind of goes back to our, our friend, Julie Werner from Atlanta. She talks about, with a low quality company, sometimes you'll run into situations where the devil will tempt you. And that kind of applies here. When you see a company where the wheels are definitely coming off and the quality is doing what you're seeing here on this chart, you ignore that red line. I mean, when you have return forecasts of 20, 30, 40, 50%, and you've got this type of a quality situation, you just don't let the devil tempt you. <laughs> the, the red line on the right-hand side of this chart is just not a good thing. So just uh, keep in mind, you, you will be tempted sometimes in situations well, think, like this. I think we're in agreement then, Mark. We're going to jettison Fossil from the okay. portfolio as well then, okay? Uh, and, Mark, the only other one we had as a possibility was Under Armour uh, and BioVerative. Uh, BioVerative, the suggestion to move it out of the portfolio is because a, a – uh, a proposition has been made for another company to buy BioVerative. It went up, what, about 40% in a couple of days on that news? Yes, it did. And it has now stayed at about $103, $104. Uh, I uh, jettisoned my BioVerative from my actual real portfolio. Uh, it came to me originally as a spinoff from Biogenetic. Uh, and I had added to it one time uh, after the spinoff, but uh, I don't think you're going to do much with that money for the next nine to 12 months until the deal actually settles. So I sold my BioVerative. Any objections, Cy or Mark, to selling the BioVerative out of this portfolio? The no. only question that, that I always have in those situations is how close is the um, – current price to the um, proposed purchase price. And if they're very close, you know, if they're, unless there's an awful lot of potential upside, if the deal comes through, what you just said about dead money for time going forward is to me a no brainer. And yeah, it's, therefore it's within you a go dollar. ahead and you sell it. Yeah, it's less than a buck. It's, in fact, it's kind of vacillated between 30 and 60 cents uh, away from the, uh, the, uh, the, the, bid price for the company. So the only downside to this might be if somebody else would step okay. in and make yeah. a better offer. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but, but uh, unless you're a speculator, you know, I think it's better because the problem is the deal falls through and it drops 40% in a day right, or more. Right. Right. So, so uh, I'm, I'm sensing that we're in agreement on that. And then Mark, you, you suggested Under Armour. Uh, that's from last time. What do you think about Under Armour? 
I think it's time to give them a timeout and just kind of strap a white Under Armour shirt to a pole and wave it as a white flag and, and, and okay. uh, continue to watch it. They have great products, guys, but the, they're clearly in a disrupted state, and we'll just watch and see if we get a, another opportunity. Okay, and that's another one on falling quality, right? It is. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to remove from the tracking portfolio Under Armour, BioVerative, Cisco, and Fossil, and we're going to take another look at SEIC and uh, Amazon and one other that is escaping my mind at the Microsoft. moment. Microsoft. Microsoft, thank you. And we're going to look at those three again next week, and that's from a, the viewpoint of a par. Nothing to do with quality on those three. Not at all. Okay, so I'm going to move into my presentation then on Starbucks. I've presented Starbucks uh, two other times to the uh, tracking portfolio. Uh, Starbucks recently reported uh, earnings for the first quarter of their of their 2018 fiscal year. They don't match the calendar, so we did get a, a new quarter coming in and those of you that are using the data from better investing remind yourself that that data is based on Morningstar data and Morningstar reports gap numbers generally accepted accounting practice numbers Starbucks reported a gap earnings of a dollar 57 this paragraph that you see in front of you was captured directly from the press release on the quarter one 2018 uh, earnings uh, that, that they put out uh, when the earnings were released. The gap earnings of $1.57 make the graph uh, move upward precipitously, makes it look like things are going gangbusters in the company, but the company makes it very clear that an awful lot of that money is a one-time gain coming from some issues on some sales in China. Uh, the actual non-GAAP adjusted number uh, that they're using to project uh, forward with is only 65 cents for earnings per share. So that's the number that uh, I'm going to keep in the top of my head. And I am noticing that of that 65 cents, uh, the accountants at Starbucks are telling me that seven cents of that is a benefit from the U.S. tax law change. Uh, the new tax law has been in effect since uh, uh, January 1st, and uh, this uh, earnings call uh, uh, was was around that date, so they already received some benefit from the U.S. tax law. So you might want to tell yourself that that could be a one-time benefit or it could be a benefit going forward. And you might want to say to yourself that that 65 cents might be a little bit soft uh, as you're trying to do your analysis. Uh, I After I read the press release and, and occasionally listen to the earnings call, I always move to the Chronicle next on a stock that I'm studying. And here's the Chronicle and no quality issues here for Starbucks. In fact, if anything, the quality uh, has bounced around a little bit uh, uh, when they were dealing with tea and having some problems with the tea. But since they've divested of the tea business, uh, the quality is actually a little bit higher than it had been previously. I'm also looking and paying attention now to that red line. That red line is par value. And uh, you can see that while it's not historically high, that might have been six or seven months ago, the par is still fairly high when you compare it to the rest of the graph. I'm looking at this point right here, uh, which is for the end of December. Uh, we'll get a new point for the end of January, and I will tell you that it will be very parallel uh, to the point that's here uh, already. It'll move off uh, to the right and be almost exactly the same value uh, moving forward unless the market does something really, really crazy one way or the other tomorrow. Uh, I'm moving then to another source that I like to use, and that's Value Line. And I'm finding a company where Value Line feels that the three to five year future returns are still double digits. Uh, believe me, that's difficult to find uh, when you're looking at, at stocks today. So many companies have a low 
return forecasts that are in the low single digits or, or zero or even negative. So when I find a double digit, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. Uh, this value line report comes before uh, the uh, quarterly report was released. And at that time, Value Line was suggesting the quarter might give 57 cents. If you remember, the non GAAP number was 65 cents with a 7 cents tax advantage. So that's uh, pretty much in the ballpark. If I take 65 minus the 7, I'm at 58. Uh, that's a, a pretty decent estimate that's matching what actually happened. Uh, and I'm looking at the tax rates here, and I'm suggesting in my mind that since Starbucks traditionally has paid taxes that were near the upper end of what corporations pay, remember that the uh, stated tax rate was 35%, so these 33s are, are, 34s are pretty near the upper end. I would suggest that Starbucks is one of those companies that has a lot to gain by the new tax law as it moves down to 21%. Uh, Starbucks has already announced that they're giving some of that money back to their employees in the form of increased wages and bonuses, uh, things like that. So they're already putting some of that tax savings to work. And again, I'll remind you that when you when you drop it into wages and bonuses, that becomes an expense and that'll fool with margins just a little bit. I'm looking at the uh, graph from the online SSG tool, and I did adjust the quarterly number. I did not adjust the pre-tax profit number to show you how the blue line looked before my adjustment. You see that hook going up on the pre-tax profit because it's not adjusted for that gap number, uh, but I did adjust the earnings per share number just to show you that while it is uh, uh, moving upwards, like I'd like to see, it's not as dramatic as it might first appear on raw data. Uh, here's the rest of the important pieces of the SSG. I'm showing you the uh, history for PEs over there. Uh, I'm noting that the high average PEs and the low average PEs, if you cross off 2013, uh, which had another huge adjustment attached to it, uh, if you look at the last four years, they're clustered reasonably tightly together at both ends, and that means I can trust the averages uh, uh, fairly much in my, in my calculation. Uh, I base this SSG on the numbers to the left, and you can see that it's coming in as a buy with a projected return par value, that's projected return, of about 15%. A total return, if I should sell it at the high PE of 32 something, at about 17%. Uh, Manifest uses PAR, the average PE going forward. So when I look at the manifest numbers, I'm getting a par of about 14, certainly in the same ballpark as my SSG. Ext extremely high quality. I really like to look at these mini industry study screens that come off uh, when I'm looking at any particular stock in Manifest. In the restaurant industry, Starbucks seems to be at the top of the list. Uh, in the discretionary, consumer discretionary sector, Starbucks comes in third behind Priceline and five below. But uh, pretty decent rankings for that company in both places. I think that the uh, earnings in this quarter were really misunderstood by a lot of people, and I don't think that the, the CEO of Starbucks did himself any good uh, by kind of uh, balling up uh, the explanation. He wasn't nearly as clear as he should have been. Sounded like he didn't practice enough answering that question, which he had to know was going to come. And I think that when people are confused, uh, they tend to sell something rather than hold on to it. I think that presents a buying opportunity for, for a lot of folks that see this as a, as a high growth Growth company. Uh, the growth in China uh, grew by 30% last year, and they're looking to really do a lot more growth. Their store count continues to grow at a 
uh, an astounding rate, even though sometimes you think you see a Starbucks every half mile, they still have a lot of store growth going on, most of it outside the country now. Uh, so I think you have a company that has the chance to, to return us 12, 13, 14, 15%. And and I'm going to add another position to the uh, portfolio. Let's move to Sai and Alliance Data Systems. Sai? All right. Thank you, Ken. And uh, here is uh, my pick uh, for the evening. Uh, I guess I have decided to fall back into, we talked earlier about Hugh doing his bottom fishing and being patient and consistent. I guess I'm starting to uh, build new favorites or whatever. This is the third uh, time that I have suggested Alliance uh, as a pick. I think the first time was last October and then November and now, um, or it may have been set, well, I wasn't here October, it must have been September, October and now. Um, but you can see uh, a good up straight parallel um, SSG. The other uh, thing that I would uh, mention from this particular chart is the value line low return forecast of 8%, which is uh, quite healthy given uh, the current uh, market with value line. So that is kind of a, a good double check. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Here is uh, where I came up with uh, Alliance Data Systems. I just ranked the portfolio by uh, projected uh, annual return. And you see that it is one of the uh, fairly high uh, ranking companies, one that I'm uh, familiar with. You notice also on here uh, Skyworks, which I'm not particularly familiar with, uh, but I have noticed popping up on some screens and, and in our portfolio uh, being being a, a solid uh, potential company. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that in a little while. Notice also uh, Starbucks uh, as well. Um, Another close company, I'll give you one and a half picks tonight. Uh, there's certainly some issues uh, with Celgene and make sure you kind of understand what's going on, but that, but Celgene was a close uh, second to, uh, to Alliance uh, tonight and I decided to go with Alliance. Next slide. Um, what I frequently do, and those of you who are uh, roundtable regulars are familiar with seeing me do something like this, I uh, frequently do a stock search uh, with, um, sometimes I use the actual parameters of the company. Here I did just a, a fairly standard uh, sweet spot stock search. You notice uh, my criteria par at 10.9, uh, I did that. Uh, effectively to get the 11% because of the way rounding works on manifest. I, I usually will go, sometimes I'll go even a couple of uh, a point or so below just because I want to see what's on the cusp, but I'll almost always go uh, a rounding uh, error below. But, uh, but the truth 11, is you just wanted to get cognizant on the list. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you, you, you had me pegged perfectly, uh, Mark. I, I'm caught. Uh, then quality of 80 financial strength. And I, I just plugged in a growth of uh, 7% uh, for this. When I ran it without the growth, there were only about three other companies that appeared. The, the growth really doesn't make much difference on this particular screen. And again, you see uh, not dissimilar lists because again, many of these companies are already on uh, in the uh, round table tracking portfolio. Uh, next slide. If we can, there we go. I'm same, having trouble making it work. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same uh, stock search. The only thing that I I did here, and and it's uh, again because of the um, long uptrend that we have had in. The the market, with the exception of the last two days that uh, indicate the world is coming to an end uh, and we're all going to be broke in within a week. Um, but but uh, we have been in a in an aging bull market that's been going on now for uh, um, pushing nine years. Uh, but even without a significant market correction for several years, um, I was just looking for a company 
that could give me some comfort level uh, that my potential appreciation has a good basis. Uh, and, and I'm kind of dancing a little bit around the projected PE. I don't like PE as a value measure, but the higher the PE that I have to rely on to get my return, the greater potential that I will not achieve my uh, return, especially in a, a frothy market where if, if the market as a whole starts going down, PEs as a whole uh, go down. And you can see uh, that Alliance Data Systems has uh, the requires the lowest PE for its return of those stocks in the um, screen. Now, I will mention, and if, if you want to go back and look at the tape, I, I talked a little bit about it in the first time I picked it back in September. Uh, there is some difference in the way value line and manifest calculates PE versus the way Morningstar data and the uh, NAIC uh, Better Investing data feed calculates PE. Um, but even with my PE that I'm using of 19, you see it would fall about halfway on this. So again, it just gives me a level of confidence that uh, my, my projections and my potential return um, has some ability to be achieved. Next slide. For those of you who aren't familiar with what Alliance Data Systems is, although it is um, uh, treated as a, a business services company uh, and a technology company, it's really um, close to a financial company. They issue store branded credit cards and that is the bulk of their business, although they don't report either on Value Line or most of their own internal reports uh, they don't give reports similar to credit card companies or banks, but by and large, they really are a financial company. Uh, the parts of the business that uh, relate to the uh, store branded credit card but are not financial related, they also uh, manage customer loyalty programs to include the largest customer loyalty uh, airlines uh, program in Canada. Um, and frequently the customer uh, loyalty programs are tied to the store branded credit cards. And then out of uh, both of those, they sell to the companies analytics. What are your customers? What are your loyal customers buying? And uh, so that you can, can market to them. And then they uh, actually use electronic marketing, primarily email. They're starting to move into the mobile device marketing uh, but uh, again, if they know that the customer is buying a certain uh, type of clothing or a certain type of kitchen equipment, Williams Sonoma is a relatively recent um, uh, vendor that has signed on or or has signed on using Alliance Data as a as a provider of data and uh, credit. Um, so Williams Sonoma, they they see that I'm buying. Uh, skillets, they may send me emails um, pushing their uh, their skillets, uh, particularly that are on sale or something. That's the, that is what Alliance Data does, is they take the credit cards, they also have uh, loyalty programs, uh, and then they use the data from uh, that, it, that, those purchases, those customers, to then drive individualized marketing as well as analytic uh, information that the company can use to see what's selling particularly to their customers and then here is my uh, judgment and bottom line uh, my sales projections a little below uh, the analyst consensus on uh, manifest at 11 uh, mine's 11 percent i believe the consensus is about 14. Uh, notice the uh, margin is i'm projecting to stay about the same uh, again, consensus is that it will go up a little bit. Um, P.E. ratio, again, I mentioned before notice um, with the numbers that I uh, plugged into the Eagle here, the current P.E. ratio is at 18.2. And again, the manifest calculated uh, is projecting a 12. I'm 
uh, projecting it to stay again about the same at 19. That's simply a, a difference in calculation. That's that's really not uh, that my projections all that much higher than the consensus is. And uh, then I come up with a projected annual return at the bottom of a very nice, uh, healthy 15.6%. So the the sales of 11% uh, that helps our portfolio sales go up just a little bit, coupled with a, a good uh, bottom line return is why i have uh, suggesting that we go with another uh, month of ADS. Thank you, Sai. Uh, let's move on to Mark's presentation. And if I can make this move. There we go. Mark, is that, that the screen you start with? Yep, it is. Okay, go ahead. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some uh, some of the stuff that I looked at when I went shopping for stocks to study. Um, these are the one percenters. By one percenters, I mean these are the ones ranked at the very top of manifest based on uh, analyst consensus expectations for both the projected annual return, the return forecast, and the quality rating. We'd love to see that up uh, high in the excellent range. And you can see all of these companies qualify, and all of them have double-digit return forecasts. So all of these are in pretty good shape. So from left to right, you can see some of those all adding up. Again, that all 100s means they're all in the top uh, percentile of uh, companies. Now, the column right in the middle, that's kind of Hugh McManus's moment here tonight. Uh, by the way, he uh, he's running around, uh, again, unable to join us. But uh, I did notice that one of his Groundhog contest selections is up about 800% in the last year. Um, so he's a threat to actually win the Groundhog again this year. Um, but one of the things he likes to do is he likes to find companies that he's familiar with and respects that are down trading near their 52-week average. So that 52-week position is basically where is the company between its 52-week low and its one-year target price. So anything down close to zero, and he likes to shop down below 20%, is a company that might merit some added attention. The other ones are a little bit higher in that scale. The next column over is the value line, three to five-year low total return. Again, we want to see that in the you know 10, 10%, maybe 15% range. So the ones up at the top are a, a little bit lean, meaning that value line is struggling with them or a little bit less optimistic. Next two columns over are Morningstar and S&P's price to fair value. Again, we're looking for something under 100%, so we're looking for red tag sales there. And uh, again, those companies that I'm centering in on the middle, uh, Celgene, Skyworks Solutions, and Prestige Brands, uh, all have fairly attractive price to fair value ratios. By the way, all three of us tonight scratched our heads pretty hard about Celgene, so maybe that's that's worth noting. Um, uh, it's a, a company worth worth study with the stuff that they're doing in cancer and autoimmune deficiencies, but uh, they are going through an executive suite shakeup and uh, pursuing some fairly major acquisitions right now. So it's uh, uh, trying to buy some pipeline could be some fairly interesting things there to keep tabs on. But I I think all three of us ended up with a bit of a headache after looking at it for a while and decided we didn't want to go for it tonight. Um, the one-year expectation for some of these companies is shown there. The average stock right now is running down around 5 or 6% according to the analyst consensus forecast for the next year. So you can see most of these are actually fairly uh, significantly above that, fairly decent outlook for the next year. So, again, maybe we catch a little bit of headwind there. Same thing with S&P in the far right column. And you can see the ones that S&P is kind of a uh, – less exuberant about right now, like five below or price line. Again, doesn't mean they're right, but uh, just something to always note. So I'm picking from those three in the middle, Celgene, Skyworks Solutions, and Prestige Brands. I'm going to go with Skyworks. It's a, a fairly interesting company that I believe Ken has brought at least once, if not twice, perhaps even seconded by the audience. So it's a, it's a repeat selection. Fairly decent long-term quality and fairly decent return forecast under these conditions. Now you can see it has been a little bit of an up and down. And as a chip maker, they make chips for a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about here. Um, 
they are going to have some cycles. So they make chips. They basically broke into the chip making business, serving Apple predominantly, and then they also serve Samsung. So they make chips for phones and things that move around like laptops. But they, the company is getting more and more into the Internet of Things, things that you will hear about uh, as you study this kind of stuff. Um, the, the chips that are needed in the autonomous driving vehicles and uh, all of the stuff that where you want to communicate with your house and and um, health related bio telemetry all of that kind of stuff the company had a pretty pretty strong presence at the consumer electronics show in las vegas i was fortunate enough to attend that and you hear a lot about 5g coming from people like qualcomm intel and others and uh, skyworks is right in there putting together solutions that work again home automobile phones communications travel all that type of stuff, they make chips that are specifically designed to do this Internet of Things stuff. Go ahead to the next slide, Ken. Keep it short and sweet. Uh, so they're a chip maker. You can see a, a pretty decent ample uh, up straight and parallel from left to right. Uh, double digit growth rates. You can see that the sales growth forecast is in the 11 to 12 percent range. Very nice margins taking shape. Lower left-hand side, you can see the net margin settling into the mid-30s. So these guys do make a decent profit on the business that they pursue. And much like Cy was saying just a few minutes ago, I really do like companies that have uh, a lower bar to jump over to generate the returns that we're forecasting. And they certainly qualify here also with a, a 15 or 16 PE ratio in order to deliver these 14, 15, 16% returns. So again, fairly decent long-term return forecast according to Value Line. You can expect some bumpiness. I think Ken would be the first to agree that when he selected a while back that we are in in it for the long haul with companies like this. So long as the as these these lines behave themselves and continue to have a similar trajectory, um, it's an interesting ride to be along as this Internet of Things takes better shape. So I'm going to go ahead and double down on that. Thanks, Ken. Okay, if, you give me, if you give me just a moment, I'll get the poll launched, and we'll let the audience choose one of these threes or none of the above. And, Ken, I'm probably going to have to step away. Step away. So okay. I'll be back for a few minutes. And I'm having a little bit of difficulty here, folks. If you can just bear with me, please. There we go. The poll, I think, is out there now. Uh, no, it's not. How about now? Uh, there we go. People are now voting. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I'm not used to doing all these things all at once here, but it'll work. So we're waiting for folks to vote. Uh, I will close the voting down when we get up around uh, 80. Well, we're at 85%. I'll give you about five more seconds. 87% of you voting. Uh, 88%. Come on, folks, give me a couple more votes and we'll go to 90, okay? Okay, and I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to display the results. And uh, Skyworks is yes. the winner. Uh, so Mark is uh, taking home the gravy, and he's not even here to enjoy yeah. his his prize. That's... So we'll have to uh, tell him when he gets back. But uh, he usually tells us that that nobody ever votes for him. So right, he'll be, he'll be very happy, folks, that we're going to put another position of Skyworks uh, in the in the mix. So I'm going to hide that poll now, and he'll I'm probably gonna... uh, leave early every month now. <laughs> when it comes I'm going to, to uh to
to move on to our uh, slide about coming attractions. And uh, next Tuesday, it'll be Turnout Tuesday. Uh, we're going to be talking about a market melt-up. We've gotten a lot of questions from folks about taxes, and we we just feel it's a little bit too early yet to be I'm, talking I'm not seriously. Seeing, we're not seeing any slides, uh, Ken, I don't believe. At least I'm not. Uh, boy, oh boy, did. There we go. I can see it now. Now you can see it? Yes. Okay. Somehow my screen got uh, closed also when I did the poll. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, requests for uh, discussion about taxes, and we feel it's just a little bit too early yet to be talking about the effects that the new tax law is going to have on your companies. We haven't forgotten about you, and we will definitely be discussing it. We'll be looking for some uh, experts in the field to help us out with the discussion, uh, but that might not be until the springtime, until we get a little bit more data and a little bit more idea of what companies are going to start to do with some of this mon uh, money. Uh, in February, our roundtable will be on the last Tuesday again, and that'll be February 27th. If you're anywhere near St. Louis in March, Mark and I will be visiting St. Louis in March, and we'll be visiting the Cincinnati-Dayton area in April. Uh, all three of us will be at the uh, Better Investing National Convention in May, and you can see Cy and Mark at the Atlanta Investing Day in August. So with all those things, we do have some questions that are on the question board. And uh, Sai, are there any of the questions we can get answered right now? Sure. The, the main one that I have uh, noticed is for me about the um, difference in PE calculation of, for um, Alliance data services between Manifest and uh, the Morningstar data. And, um, uh, uh, the the if you if you pull up the value line report on ADS, you will see that every year from 2003 through 2016, uh, down in the footnotes, value line excluded um, extraordinary um, expenses. It would be in this case, and and in particular, apparently excluded. Um, option, stock options and related expenses. And those expenses amounted to significant amounts. In fact, for example, during uh, 2016, it was $9.58. Uh, that was more than half of Value Line's reported earnings of $16.92. So, uh, when you when when you took the value line numbers, which is what manifest basic numbers are used, although the projections are consensus projections, the underlying data is value line data. Um, value line data was running roughly twice the EPS than gap reported. EPS, and that was every year. That was not just one year off. That was every year. And so the PEs were, again, the inverse value lines PEs were about half what the gap calculated PEs uh, would be. So that's why, and back in the September presentation, I actually showed my SSG numbers using gap compared to the value line numbers from Manifest. Uh, I didn't carry that forward today. Now, going forward, that may change because in 2016, which is what uh, was the last data that I used tonight and the last data that Manifest had, Value Line did not add back it, what they termed irregular expenses or options expenses for 2017. So the 2017 numbers match. So that's why the PEs were not as widely variant uh, tonight as they have been. But that that it's it's just that value lines normalization and normally value line is not as drastic every year, but uh, in ADS's case it is. Uh, si, I'm going to add a little bit to the top of that. Uh, folks, those of you that are using better investing data, uh, when you use the toolkit or when you use the SSG Plus, 
and you go in and adjust earnings data to match adjusted data, uh, you'll notice that if you're adjusting numbers in a completed fiscal year, you'll notice PEs in section three adjusting themselves. The arithmetic is adjust uh, is, is calculated right within the tool. So if you go into Starbucks, for example, on that one year that was really out of whack and adjust it back uh, for the adjusted report that Starbucks made in 2015, uh, you'll see the PEs move to a very reasonable place, uh, not those 1,000 plus PEs that were on that line that was discarded uh, in the Starbucks SSG. So uh, it, it's just a, a matter of which earnings are you going to use because whatever earnings you use, that's what the PEs are going to be based on then. I don't any other see questions, any, Cy? I don't see any other questions. There were a couple of comments about uh, early on with our uh, discussion of the uh, returns um, uh, for NetEase and the various companies, but they were primarily just comments about uh, folks would like to see a little bit more information on the dashboard about uh, numbers of selection and the how long we had held uh, the companies. Okay, that's a <laughs> that that sounds like an easy thing, and it's a it's a quite <laughs> it's, daunting it's yes. quite daunting. <laughs> You and I both know that keeping those records uh, are, are really fairly uh, complicated, uh, but we'll we'll make an attempt to let you know if there's any specific uh, questions you need to to ask. Uh, don't be afraid to drop a line to Mark at manifestinvesting.com or to myself at kcavula1 at comcast.net. I want to take a moment before we wind up to thank all of you throughout the country that uh, uh, saw fit to send a donation to the mid-Michigan chapter uh, thanking us and, and putting a few dollars behind that thanks uh, for the programs that we put out to the whole country. Uh, we got uh, enough donations from enough different friends and chapters throughout the country uh, to guarantee that MidMichigan will be in business at least through the year 2021. So we're, we're so happy that you saw uh, fit to tell us that our programs help you on a day-to-day -day basis and that, that it was worth 25 or 30 or 50 bucks to you. And uh, I, I don't need any more money now, folks. So find another uh, great charity and send it to another great nonprofit. But for those of you that did, that did send us a few dollars, it's greatly appreciated and it will be put to good use. We've already bought our GoToMeeting license for this year and uh, that money already helped us buy a new cord for our projector, uh, which we couldn't even get enough dollars uh, to buy that cord. So we're very happy and very, very thankful that the collection plate was returned with a, a couple of bucks in it. Um, if Cy and, doesn't have anything, go on, Cy. Yeah. Uh, Ann Manning has her hand up, so I'm going to unmute her and let her ask great. a question. Hi. Uh, uh, great, great deal tonight, guys. I enjoyed it. Uh, you made me feel good because some of the stuff that you sewed, I sewed this week, and I was really <laughs> doubtful if I should have done that. But um, one of the things I wanted to ask if we could look at, um, I sewed Abby and I, I did it because it had gone up so much but I also did it because of what you've been talking about where the quality went down and I don't know if you can bring that up and and see if, if I was uh, a little bit too quick on the trigger on this uh, but I, I, I didn't want to lose the profits especially when it shows on the uh, manifest uh, form that the quality has gone down. Yeah, and normally we could do that uh, because we have uh, enough people with enough screens to make all that work, but uh, we're working a little bit handicapped this oh, evening. Okay. We're working from my computer rather than Mark's uh, equipment. So could you drop Mark that question and we'll be sure to address it at the next round table in four weeks, okay? No, not a problem, thanks. Thank you and very much. 
And I see one more hand. Uh, Eve Lewis uh, has hers up, so I'm unmuting you, Eve, if you wanted to. Well, I'm trying to unmute you. Let's. Uh... Well, Ken, can you see if you can unmute Eve? For some reason, I'm I not. will give it a try. Oh, it says she is self-muted and by us. So, Eve, if you are here and listening, if you would unmute yourself. Okay, we've got you unmuted now. Okay, okay. there you go. And now I'll, we can I'll hear unmute. you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I was just looking for a place to write a, write a thank you comment to you all and said what a um, great presentation it was this evening. So, I... I was uh, touching the different icons uh, on the front to uh, just write a comment. So, um, you know, thanks a lot and look forward to seeing you in Cincinnati, Dayton in April and at Bink. We'll be there. Thank you so much for your kind words, Eve. Uh, uh, if we have nothing else, Si, I'm going to stop the recording. And thank everybody so much for being here this evening, and we hope to see you next Tuesday at Turnout Tuesday or a month from now at the Mid-Michigan Roundtable. Thank you all. Good night. Good night, everybody.